Hi, Bob. Good Hi, afternoon. how are you? Good. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. Good. We're so excited to have you today. I'm excited too. This um <laughs> I I'll explain privately, I guess. Um I so so there are just so you know before you start, there are two people in the wings. We we can't see them right now, but people just start logging on um <clears throat> even though we can't see them. So it's not entirely <laughs> private, just so you know. Oh, and that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um I think the funny thing about the show is um I started thinking about why is Maine different than other New England states, in fact, anywhere in the Northeast or even the East. And I started to piece some of the puzzle together and so much of it is historical. And it all comes down to why do we look the way we do? Why do we have so many birds in such varied habitat? And some of it is just fascinating stuff I never knew until I dug into it. That's so cool. I'm so excited to learn today myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Certainly. <that's> cool. <laughs> Awesome. Did you want to try and share any slides or was there Sure. Let me just uh, share screen right now. There. How's that look? That looks good. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just leave that up there then. <laughs> That's great. Is that a John Singer Sargent painting or? No, uh, a Wyatt, a Wyeth, Jamie oh, Wyeth. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Andrew Wyeth. Right. Andrew Wyeth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one is like one of the most famous main paintings ever. Yeah, totally. It's called, it's called Christina's World. <laughs> oh, yes. I definitely recognize it. I just couldn't yeah. point the artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Noel. Hi. How are you Hello, doing? Hello, Bob. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> awesome. Lander, um, are do you feel good about the captions? I hope that they come up. I <clears throat> um our office coordinator um said that she believed she turned them on. And so Hopefully, um, hopefully they're working. I I was wasn't able to log in at three thirty as we had talked about um, because my husband wasn't home and I still had my two year old with me. Um, but I I'm not sure. Let's see. Oh, you know what? I actually see a button down here that says show captions and it says English. So I think now we should be good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it looks like it. Yeah. Awesome. On and the screen I'm sharing, do you see any of the controls or other dialogues up at the top of the screen, or is that just visible to me? I don't see any of them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Had some occasions where some of that stuff is visible through the whole show, and that's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like to me someone um, enabled closed captioning, so I guess that's also an option. It sounds like if you don't want to see the captions, you can close it on your end too, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize. Great. It's a good feature. Yeah. So welcome to those of you who are already signing on. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll wait until around 4 p.m. to get started. So Bob, how many years have you been involved in the festival? All of them. <laughs> really? Oh, Since yeah. the beginning? Since the beginning. That's yep. amazing. I was trying to count the years because this is really only my second year. Mm. Um, I did miss, I think I missed last year because I went to Alaska for a month. Oh, um, okay. Was, Maybe that's why we haven't met. Right. Yeah, I think that's why. Okay. And there was, I think the COVID year where not much happened. But aside from that, <laughs> um, I was one of the very first leaders and have been doing it ever since. Amazing. Well, that's, that's not the best of it. I do the Down East Spring Birding Festival one week later, and that's going on its 20th year now. And I've been doing that one since the beginning. And the following weekend, I'll do the Acadia Birding Festival. So 
This well, is the time of year where I don't have a life. <laughs> Your life is devoted to the birds. Yes, it is. Well, I'm so happy for you that you found such an enduring passion that you. you've devoted 20 years mm -hmm. of, of bringing it to other people, um, educa educating people, getting them excited about what you know. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's fun. And uh, I started a YouTube channel uh, a year or so ago uh, where I can put a lot of my accumulated wisdom online <laughs> for uh, for people to enjoy and learn. That's great. Yeah. And when I say accumulated wisdom, most of what I accumulated is because I'm getting old and not because I'm getting wise. I just have a long history of learning a few things here and there. <laughs> Well, feel free to, if at any point you want to mention your YouTube channel during your presentation, I'm sure the attendees mm -hmm. would love to know about that. Yep. How would you like to handle any, this is a webinar format, I guess, so audience participation is limited except to maybe chat and uh, they can forward questions to you. Yeah. 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 So if it works with your presentation, oftentimes there's like a 10 minute um, or 10, 15 minute Q&A at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people can put their questions in the chat box as you go along. And then Noel and I kind of read through them to help you find them and we can read them out loud and you mm -hmm. can answer all the ones we can get to. Yeah, that's just fine. Okay. Cool. This you... has been one strange year. The winds have the last two weeks been strong from the northwest almost every day. That has mixed up the birds who like to fly in a tailwind. So they've mm. like trickled in. And then every now and then when the wind stops, they they swoop in. And it's, mm. it's a very strange migration to watch. Interesting. Mm. I heard that the bluebirds seem to be nesting later this year. I don't know if that's something that you've observed, um, but I wonder if it's because of that that wind. Probably not the wind so much. It was cold for a period. And this, a lot of the bluebirds, because the winter really kind of ended early, mm. they started to get active early and laid eggs perhaps too early and some nests failed and they're doing it again. Oh. So it, it seems to be cutting both ways. They can re-nest uh, one of the species that can do that pretty readily. That's good. Yeah, really. They can do what? Read nest. Re nest. Yeah. If if they oh, fail. Oh, re nest. Okay. Yeah. If they, if they fail, they can try again. Mm. So, would you say that different species are more adaptable than others? Yeah. Um. Definitely. Uh. You know, larger species, eagles and hawks and stuff. If they fail, they they're done. Uh, loons, you know, the larger species, um, which have to raise their eggs for longer, they, they get one shot at it. But the small ones, I had a pair of Phoebes who failed twice and succeeded on the third time a couple of years ago. So wow. uh, a lot of the smaller ones can do it until they run out of food. And some species can raise more than one family a year. Oh, really? Morning doves, and especially in the southern U.S. with a milder winter, uh, can raise up to six broods in a year. Wow. Yeah. Around here, I've seen them do it three times on my porch one summer. Wow. Yeah. So they're, they're, um, the nesting must not last long then, as opposed to other birds where they like care for their they're young for mm -hmm. a while yes that's exactly okay. right they're like get out yep. <laughs> well i got golden... more <laughs> i got more to to take well, care of and it's a strategy for some birds golden crown kinglets which is the smallest bird that can survive a main winter um they nest and then as soon as the first family is fledged dad takes care of that family while mom goes to start a second brood Wow. And they keep their numbers up just by making a whole lot of babies, many of which won't survive the winter. Mm -hmm. 
but they just make a lot. So yeah. some of these natural strategies out there can be pretty weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is it true that robins um, build like one nest on the ground and then one nest in trees oftentimes? Have you heard that? No, I have not heard that. I've not really seen robins on the ground, maybe close to the ground on some occasions, but usually they're eye height or bigger or higher. Yeah, but, that's but what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, um, I've not heard of a ground nesting robin. Uh, other thrushes, which, you know, some of the thrushes in your woods, for instance, Hermit thrushes nest on the ground. Yeah. Squinches thrushes nest in trees. I forget where Veery's nest. <laughs> mm. I heard a blue-eyed Vireo the other day. I'm just learning the call <laughs> using the, the, the Merlin app, which is so helpful. <laughs> yeah, I know it. That's that's such a great tool, and they do a great job with it. it it's not perfect. You have to treat everything as a strong suggestion. Okay. Um, no. And I like to play with it to see if I can fool it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can sometimes. Nice. <laughs> well, it looks like it's 4 p.m. So if you both are ready, we could get started. <clears throat> I'll just I'll do a little introduction and Noel will talk about how participants um, can interact at the end and then we'll pass it over to you, Bob. OK, so welcome, everybody. Um, to another Friends from the Field webinar. If this is um, uh, your first one, this series is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust. Um, and we have a, quite a large archive of past webinars that people can access either at the Blue Hill Heritage Trust YouTube channel or on the Island Heritage Trust website um, or Blue Heritage Trust website as well. So feel free to take a look at those if you're interested on a rainy day. Um, and we're so excited to have Bob here today to talk about birds and uh, Maine and the, the weirdness factor too, which I'm excited <laughs> to learn more about. Um, and I will just, I'll read uh, Bob's bio now because I have that here in front of me. Um, he is a birding guide and author and spearheaded creation of the Maine Birding Trail. Bob writes weekly birding columns in the Bangor Daily News and produces YouTube videos about birding in Maine and beyond. Bob, we're so excited to have you here. Um, and we can't wait to hear more about what you have to share with us. Well, great. Um, and this is this could be a lot of fun for me too, because uh, I started to think about why is Maine different than the rest of New England and the entire Eastern United States? Because um, it is very different. And uh, I've tried to put all the pieces together. Why do we have so many birds? Why do we have so much varied habitat compared to other states? What historically and currently is happening to make us that blessed? And I realized a lot of it is weird. So we're going to do some. Uh, whoops. Now we're going to do some time traveling in this. And the first thing we're going to do is go back about 300 million years, <laughs> because 300 million years ago, this is what the world looks like. Uh, all the continents had come together in something called Pangaea or Pangaea, and uh, there was just a continental collision 300 million years ago. So this is what it looked like. Then they broke apart. So the question is, what state is closest to Africa? Now, think about it for just a second. What state is closest to Africa? And if you're thinking Florida, you're thinking the same thing I did when I first asked myself that question. But... This is what it looked like 300 million years ago when we were joined together. And you'll notice that up there in the circle, it's Morocco right next to Maine. And today, it's still the case. In fact, it's this spot right here. Kwadi Head State Park in Lubeck is the closest spot to, Af to Africa. It's uh, uh, directly on a line to Morocco. So that's what happened historically. And so you have the continents coming together, crashing together, and then breaking apart. And you end up with a coastline that looks like this. So we have a really jagged, rugged coast. The rockbound coast of Maine is famous by that term. And it's all because continents came together, smashed into each other, and then broke apart. So you've got a coastline that looks like this. You go south, you get into the barrier islands all the way down the eastern seaboard to Florida. And the coast looks like this. You don't have that jagged coast because there wasn't quite the collision effect that there was up here. So right away, 600 or 300 million years ago, 
We're weird. Then, to see how really rugged the coast is, to get up the coast of Maine from Kittery to Calais, uh, it's about 228 miles. That's how long the coast is, 228 miles. And that puts us ninth among all the states with a saltwater coastline. But if you smooth that out, we jump up to fourth place because there are so many nooks and crannies and islands and bays and coves that where salt water meets the land, we have 3,478 miles of that. We leap ahead of California and how much salty coast we have. So we're that rugged. If you smooth it out, we've got a really long intersection of coastline. And that even affects the islands. Maine has roughly 3,200 coastal islands. In fact, we have so many islands, we don't even know how many for sure we have. Uh, some are, they're only at low tide. But the coastal island registry, for instance, lists uh, 3,372 islands. Compare that to Alaska, which uh, is famous, probably does have the most islands in America. And it's got 2,670 named islands, probably a bunch more unnamed. Some of those islands uh, in the Pribilofs and the... Uh, the Aleutians are bigger than what Maine has, so we'll give them credit for having more and bigger islands. But the point is, our coast is a jagged mess. And so you get to Stonington, and here's what it looks like offshore. If you look at Stonington from the air, nothing else in the eastern seaboard of the United States, all the way down to Key West, looks like this. So we have a very rugged coastline, and it all goes back to that continental collision for the most part. But there is also a second factor, and that's the Ice Age. So 25,000 years ago, this is what North America looked like. And if you can see over there on the right side of the screen, the Ice Age uh, went all the way down to New Jersey, into Pennsylvania. Um, it certainly was way over Maine. So we were right at the heart of where it was hitting into the ocean. So the Ice Age 25,000 years ago changed whatever the continental collision didn't. And to give you some idea how dramatic it was, 11,000 years ago, the ice melted. Things warmed up. The land, which had been suppressed by all this weight, started to bounce back up. And 11,000 years ago, um, we started to have this develop. What you're looking at here is a blueberry field in Columbia Falls, Maine. This is actually where the ocean edge was, and you can see it today. You can go there, visit this spot, and you can see on the right side where it comes up the beach into the dune area, and anything below that was all ocean 11,000 years ago. All of that is still present along the coast of Maine and findable in certain places. It's easiest in blueberry fields because there are no trees. Um, but you can actually see where the ocean line was, all because of what the Ice Age did to us long ago. So now you have well-drained sandy soil left behind by the glaciers, and that is absolutely perfect for growing blueberries. Not bad for growing potatoes either. Uh, they like well-drained soil. So what the glaciers did to Maine left it with a landscape that often looks like this, well-drained sandy soil, especially along the coastline. And of course, in many places, it just dumped a whole lot of rocks too. What it means for birds, for those who remember this is partly a bird chat, is we have some birds here that you don't usually find outside of the prairie states out west, so upland sandpiper. Um, it's an uncommon bird in Maine, but it's all over our blueberry fields because it kind of resembles the habitat that they had back uh, in the prairie states. So you've got those in Maine. You've got Vesper Sparrow, which is common out west, not very common here. But because of what the glaciers did to us, they are present on those blueberry fields. This is a great place for snow buntings to come in the winter. They breed up in the Arctic, but you should see how many snow buntings flock to those blueberry barrens once again in down east Maine. And really, much along the coast of Maine, they can show up too in some of the marshland areas that are uh, dry enough for them to settle in and feed. So once again, a lot of our birds were influenced by what happened uh, during the Ice Age. In fact, if you look at Katahdin and realize that the peak of the Ice Age, the ice, the uh, snow was about two miles high. The mountain's only one mile high. So it went a mile over Katahdin. And when you see those big chunks on the side of the mountain, that's what the glaciers broke off from Katahdin and carried to the sea. 
So the glaciers obviously had a major impact on why Maine looks the way it does. And also when it melted, it left lots of puddles in places that didn't have any drainage. And so we are a very boggy state. This is the Orono Bog Boardwalk, just north of the Bangor Mall. A lot of boggy areas in Maine that you don't really find south of where we are now. Add to that the Gulf of Maine. This is unique too, although I can't say we can claim it all because of course it extends all the way down to Cape Cod. But something else happened during the ice ages and that is at the peak of the ice age, the ice sheet went all the way out into the Gulf of Maine or what is now the Gulf of Maine and dumped a lot more material out there. So you see the Georges Bank, which was famous for fishing, the Scotian Shelf, which is Nova Scotia, just a little further north. And this is about 360 miles off the coast of, let's say, Scudic Point in Acadia National Park at the, at the outer edge. It dumped a lot of material out there. Um, and sort of closed off the Gulf of Maine so that there's this northeast channel that runs right through the middle of it. And it takes a lot of cold water from the Labrador current and dumps it into the Gulf of Maine. The uh, Gulf Stream, which is famous for its warm weather coming up from the equator and going over to Europe, bypasses Maine completely. So what we have is extremely cold water, water comparative to other places at our latitude. And it's all because the narrow Northeast Channel takes Labrador current water, dumps it in there where it's isolated and it stays cold. And so what we have and nobody else does in the United States is colonies of puffins, Atlantic puffins. Maine is the only one that has puffins. Uh, we have razorbills, nobody else does. And um, these are common MERS, by the way, sorry. Uh, and then uh, of course we have a lot of tern colonies too. We have five puffin colonies along the coast we have even more colonies for terns. So we have a lot of uh, islands. We have a lot of nesting islands all in the Gulf of Maine, taking advantage of that food rich supply of, uh, of uh, food in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, coal water uh, holds more oxygen. It allows more breeding of uh, small sea creatures, plankton and stuff to happen. So our waters are not only cold, they're food rich. And it's because of what the glaciers did by isolating the Gulf of Maine uh, from the Gulf Stream and further out. We're just unnaturally cold. And because of all that food, we also have the industry of whale watching. And this is like most famous boat in Maine to do it. So we have whales. These whales will uh, raise, will uh, give birth down to the Caribbean where they won't eat while they're down there. They will come back up and fatten up in the summer in the cold waters of the Gulf of Maine and up into Canada. The same thing is happening with a lot of seabirds. So these are great uh, um, shearwaters. There's an island group uh, be halfway between South America and Africa, way out in the, uh, the middle of the South Atlantic, the Tristan de Kahuna um, Islands. That's where these guys nest. They come all the way up to the Gulf of Maine when it's their winter down there and our summer up here, so they can feed in the cold waters of the Gulf of Maine. They come in by the thousands. Sometimes you see enormous flocks. Wilson storm petrel nest across the South uh, Antarctic area and along the coast of uh, Southern Argentina. They come up, maybe one of the most numerous birds in the entire world. And they come up into the Gulf of Maine during their off season to take advantage of our food rich waters. Northern gannet breeds up on Northern islands up in Quebec and Newfoundland, and then just leisurely go back and forth through the Gulf of Maine feeding as they go. So again, because we are so cold in the Gulf of Maine and trap so much food, we're a destination for a lot of the avian populations and the marine mammals, just because of what the glaciers did 25,000 years ago. That's the good news. Bad news is this is what's happening now. Because of climate change, the Gulf of Maine is considered to be, if not the fastest, close to the fastest warming body of water on Earth. Uh, we are warming up a little too fast. We are seeing changes because of that. All that red is water that is warming uh, in the ocean right now. And about the reddest spot is right there in the Gulf of Maine. We have, obviously, huge tides. And here's why. Um, if you look at, if you were in Portland uh, up to maybe Bar Harbor, tides tend to be about 10 feet. But then you get up to the northern part of Maine into Washington County and you start to get that funneling effect. 
So as the moon is pulling its gravity on the water and it's surging back and forth out there in the ocean, it starts to get funneled into the Bay of Fundy till it goes all the way up towards the tip of uh, Nova Scotia, where it's funneled up to 49 foot tides, the highest tides in the world. But back down in Maine, it's still 20 feet up there in Washington County. And so these huge tides have a few huge effect on a lot of our bird population, starting with the shorebirds. What we end up with is enormous mudflats. And every time the water drops at low tide and reveals those mudflats, it also drops a lot of food into the mud and the rocks. And uh, we are the banquet table. Oops, excuse me a second. Start. We, uh, we are a banquet table for all the shorebirds that uh, nested up in the Arctic. Um, you don't see these huge mudflats once you get a little further south. Uh, Scarborough Marsh does pretty well. Uh, there's a lot of tidal intermarsh, uh, interwater area there that they can feed on. But once you get south of New England, these birds have to go a long way before they can refuel again. We are a major stop for shorebirds because of what the tides are doing. So these are Sanderlings and Dunlin there on the right-hand side. Also, I'll say uh, the east, the uh, passage, Head Harbor Passage between the U.S. and Canada, uh, between Eastport and Campobello, I personally think is world class. The tide is there in there is so strong. It's got the second uh, biggest whirlpool in the world called the Old Sow. That's between Deer Island and Canada and Eastport. Uh, second biggest whirlpool in the world. The tides in there are so strong. When I take a boat in there, I've got to rev the engine up just to stand still. <laughs> Uh, and the sea life that goes in there is prodigious. Uh, it's off the charts. I think uh, it's underappreciated for the world caliber location that it is. Uh, and it's because of the tides. You have Bonaparte's gulls that will go in there by the tens of thousands. These are small dainty gulls that nest up in fresh water. They're actually a tree nesting gull. They flood in there 10,000 at a time, 20,000 as possible in some years, uh, all right there in Head Harbor Passage. We are an exceptionally wet state. How wet are we? Well, 25% of Maine's land area is wetland. A quarter of the state is considered to be wet. Compare that to the rest of New England. We are four times wetter than the other five New England states combined. Four times more wetland than the other five combined. We are that wet. And so a lot of it is salt water. This is Scarborough Marsh, the largest estuary in Maine. But you've also got your raging rivers and your lakes up in northern Maine, your lakes and ponds. You can't drive more than 10 minutes in any direction in Maine without hitting a lake. There aren't a lot of states south of us that can say that. If I remember right, Maryland has exactly one natural lake. So Maine is just weird by how wet it is compared even to the rest of New England. We stand out. This is Spencer Pond, another place that once you get up in the woods, there is, I think, one settlement, and it's just a sporting camp on one side of the lake, and that's it. So we have a lot of water, and a lot of it's uninhabited. And because of that, of course, we have a lot of ducks, like this hooded merganser. We have a lot of secret birds, like this Virginia rail that hides down in the cattails. A sora, which does the same thing. We have a lot of these birds that a lot of times people don't even see, but they're there, and it's because of just how wet we are. We are forested. In fact, we are the most forested state in America. We're nearly 90% forest. Uh, New Hampshire comes a little bit close, and then it starts to drop off pretty precipitously. Uh, until I really started to piece this together, I thought Alaska is going to be right up there. It's all wilderness. But then you get to Alaska, and you realize, no, a lot of this is tundra. You get over to Nome, and it's hard to find a tree. And of course, in Alaska, the tree line is so low that a lot of it is above elevation. So Alaska ends up being about 35% forested, even a state you think of as being covered in trees. Uh, and then you get to a prairie state like North Dakota, and there are no trees at all. So we are the most forested state in America. And of course, historically, what does that mean? We log trees. A lot of what Maine is now is what it always was, very forested and a place to cut wood. So that's been our history right from the get-go. And that industrialized the forest in many ways. 
Uh, so you have trains up in the main North Woods. In fact, some of those trains were left there as the logging abated, and the trains are still sitting there. These two are famous. They are uh, just north of, uh, of uh, Chamberlain Lake, just as the transition over to Eagle Lake. These are iconic trains. They're, they're part of the state's lore right now because uh, it didn't it wouldn't have been practical to take them back out again after they'd served their purpose. So they just left them there. There are artifacts like that up in the North Woods scattered all over based in our history. We're just weird that way. A lot of our Northern Maine area looks like this. There are, once the uh, river drivers stopped hauling wood to the mills over the rivers uh, in the early seventies, uh, roads took over and we were starting to truck all that wood out. So there are just roads everywhere in Northern Maine. Not a lot of people, but you can get just about anywhere. It does help to have a four wheel drive pickup in many of those roads and a really good idea where you're going because this is what's up there and not a lot of people. This is what uh, you can expect in the North Main woods because it is not settled. It is still pretty wild. And a lot of that wild goes back a long way. And it's one reason Maine is unique compared to other states. We have a long tradition of public access to private land. And you can go to most other states in the country. Uh, I, I can't think of many other examples where you're allowed to go on private land without asking permission. Uh, when I'm birding, chasing birds in Louisiana, I don't dare get off the road. Texas, I don't dare get off the road. Michigan uh, has a strong law about private property. Most places, you are trespassing if you're on land, even if it isn't posted. And you are subject to trespassing charges or even serious land owner protection. Um, what Maine is, is unique. Uh, for most states and what you can do on private land. And that private access to uh, the, to uh, public access to private land is unique and very special to us. And a lot of it goes way, way back to when we were part of Massachusetts. There was a colonial ordinance within the Massachusetts Bay Colony back in 1641 that established the fact that the public can go on coastal and inland waters, mostly to go chase fish and birds. Uh, and it became part of the common law of Massachusetts uh, and Maine was at that time part of Massachusetts. And all that common law stems from an English tradition that existed before that. So our public access to private land is as old as England. And that tradition sort of got imported over to Massachusetts, but not so much anywhere else. So we retain that. We, this custom is still very strong today. There's presumed, pre, uh, presumed permission to use private land that is not improved or posted. And then some of this had clarified in the legislature. So the Great Ponds Act of 1973 clarified that a public can cross unapproved, undeveloped private land uh, to reach any body of water over 10 acres. If it's posted, if it's gated, you don't necessarily have a right to go over and develop land, but even if it's gated and there's no other um, barring access, you can walk past it and walk to a lake or a pond. You can carry your canoe in there if you wanna carry it. We have that tradition in Maine, and that is really weird because it does not exist in most other places. We also have the North Maine Woods uh, Association, which I love these guys. Uh, they manage about 300 acres up there of all the uh, 300 million acres, uh, 3 million acres, beg your pardon, uh, the North Maine Woods uh, and for various landowners and also for the state of Maine, which owns land there too. And they manage all the recreational use of the lands up there. So not only is it known that we have private uh, public access to private land, it's actually managed uh, so that we can use somebody else's land to go recreate on. And that's, again, something that's really weird in Maine. We are wild. How wild are we? A lot of this goes back very historically. Let's go back 270 years ago. Back then, we had a series of wars. We had the French and Indian War, followed by the American Revolutionary War, and that didn't settle everything. We had the War of 1812. So we had three consecutive periods of war when a lot of the interior part of the state was just too dangerous to go into. Not only did you have warring sides, but you also had uh, shifting allegiances among the natives who lived here. So various uh, tribes and groups would uh, form alliances with either the British side or the French side or the Americans. And when you got too far away from safety, you were in great jeopardy. 
So during that entire period, it was really just dangerous to get into the Maine woods. So it remained pretty much off limits right up until Maine became a state. So if you look at a map of Maine back in, 19, in 1778, this is the area that was roughly settled. If you were along the coast, ships could help defend you. You had access to a way out because there really weren't roads. Um, but you could get out if necessary. You could be defended. You can get militia in there and move them around by boat. Um, you get a little further in, uh, you have river access. It was tidal right up to the uh, Bangor and the Penobscot River. And so some of this was defensible along the, the Kennebec. So Maine is a little bit settled as you're advancing as a state after the Revolutionary War. But once you start to get up in the yellow area and further north, it's still too dangerous until all these wars are settled. So in 1820, this is Bangor right there, about uh, just under the line. It was really too dangerous to go north of that line. So just about all of the northern half of the state stayed completely wild. The other thing that happened after all these wars is that Massachusetts, which was still technically the owner of Maine, was dead broke. It had all these war debts, no easy way to pay them off. So what they did was eventually grant independence to Maine, but they also retained half of the unallocated territories in Maine. I don't think a lot of people know this, and I didn't really know it either until I started looking into this, but the act that uh, allowed Maine to become a state reserved for Massachusetts much of Maine in the northern part of the state, and Massachusetts could sell it off, and they could uh, trade it off for other things, and they did. So even after we were a state, Massachusetts still owned a large chunk of us and used it um, for revenue and sold it off to pay debts. There's even a small place called Massachusetts Gore, right up there on the uh, main Quebec border, way up in the northern part of the state, that is called Massachusetts Gore. One of the things they did was sell off some of this property. Uh, Bingham, William Bingham, was a really very fabulously rich guy in Philadelphia. And he bought a million acres in Maine from Massachusetts. And later he bought another million acres. He was one of the biggest landowners ever at that time, and he just bought part of Maine because Massachusetts was selling it. Massachusetts also donated whole townships to favored groups. They couldn't necessarily, with their debt, uh, do any state government funding of some of this. So they sold, passed, or donated parts of Massachusetts so that these favored groups could raise their own money from it. Uh, Bowdoin College was a particular beneficiary. Back when Maine was part of Massachusetts, Bowdoin College was as significant as Harvard. Uh, and uh, so those that big block right there in the southern part of uh, that area you're seeing on the map, that's two grants that were given to Bowdoin College for their use. Some of the others went to churches and schools. There's one called the Middle, uh, Middlesex Canal Project. Um, Middlesex Canal at one time in Massachusetts around the Boston area rivaled the Erie Canal for moving goods and services till the roads were up to snuff. And so a lot of the funding for that came uh, as a donation for Massachusetts uh, with a parcel in Maine, which is still named that on our Delorme Maine atlases. So Massachusetts donated parts of Maine to raise money. They still have those names in those parcels on the state map. About that time, of course, it starts to be consolidated into really large ownership. And if you see that map on the left, that's Great Northern Paper, which owned an enormous chunk of the Maine woods as we started to not only cut timber for the market for sawmills, but also started to make paper. Great Northern Paper owned one heck of a lot of the northern part of the state. And you can see just how much it really was. Then other groups, large groups, uh, millionaires, et cetera, um, bought large chunks of Maine. Uh, it eventually ended up in family hands and their heirs and still is today. Uh, so the largest landowner in Maine is owned by a family. That's the Irving family up there in Aroostook County. They're Canadian. Uh, they still own all that green. The Pingree heirs uh, own a lot of that uh, darker yellow. Uh, the Haynes family, you can see down there, um, own a little bit of green. There's John Malone, who's a media baron uh, right now today. He's the second largest landowner in America. Owns, I think, 2.2 uh, million acres. Half of that, almost half of that, is in Maine. The only 
group that owns more than that is the Wagner family, which owns, I think, 2.3 million acres of California. Uh, but John Malone, a media baron, still owns a huge chunk. So you've got these large, large parcels of ownership still owning it mostly for the timberland. And so Maine just is not available to develop further north of here. And then on top of all of this, something happened a while ago that uh, people forgot about. And that is when Maine became a state, uh, it was figured that eventually there'd be towns here, there would be a need for places to put schools and churches. So as all this land was divvied up and uh, sold off or donated off, a part of it was supposed to be retained for the state where they could eventually put their schools and churches. Well, that never happened. And for 150 years, everybody just sort of forgot about that law. Somehow it resurfaced back in the early 1970s. It eventually went to court when somebody said, wait a minute, Maine is supposed to own one ninth of every one of these townships uh, and whatever happened to all of that? And it was litigated in court for a long time. Eventually the Supreme Court sided with the state and said, yes, you do have an ownership interest in all this land. Eventually, uh, it was agreed upon to consolidate that, aggregate it, uh, and uh, some of that became into the sole control of the state in a more usable form, which is now 600,000 acres of public reserve land. So much of why our North Maine looks the way it does goes back hundreds of years, and certainly 150 years. And that's why we are as wild as we are still today up in the North Woods. And it's still going on. Uh, we're still protecting and conserving more land. We have the Nature Conservancy, which is now a fairly large landowner in Northern Maine. We have the Forest Society of Maine, which works deals to put more land into conservation. When Plum Creek tried to do development and do a, a lake concept planned around Moosehead Lake, the first requirement was they had to put a lot of acreage into permanent conservation, even if their project didn't work. Well, the project didn't work, but the land is now still conserved. And that's I think 100,000 acres, but it's a large chunk. So Maine is still in a state that can't easily be developed in the north. And let's just take a moment, a moment to remember that this land didn't really belong to any of us back when it was first divvied up. The only reason we're having this talk right now is because the English claimed dominion over this, and then kings issued charters saying that somebody besides the original occupants uh, had control over it. Uh, the fact is, we're still fighting some of that today as well. But remember, this land really didn't belong to the colonies and colonials who came in here and essentially took most of it. Be that as it may, we are extremely wild compared to most other states in the East. We have more black bears than any other state east of the Mississippi. We have as many black bears as states three times our size out west. So Colorado, Oregon, Washington State. They are much bigger than Maine is, but we have the same number of bears that they do. We just have a lot of wildlife here. Moose, we've got a whole lot of moose and a lot of people uh, look at Maine as an example of how you can have that many moose in the state when uh, climate change and ticks are really hurting the herd elsewhere as they are in Maine. But we still have a lot of moose in the state. We have Canada lynx. Um, they were extirpated, I think, in uh, most of the northern parts of New England. I understand maybe a couple have leaked back into New Hampshire. Um, I ran into four this winter uh, up in the North Maine woods. We have Canada lynx in Maine, and not many other states can make that claim. Another funny artifact about history, we have a lot of debates ongoing right now about what can happen in the Gulf of Maine with wind power. Uh, right now, it's been an argument for a while, who has uh, regulatory control over when wind power can go? And the answer right now is if it's within three miles of mainland, that area of the sea has uh, main regulation. But if it's beyond three miles, that's federal regulation. Why three miles? Well, the answer is back in those Revolutionary War days and the War of 1812, the biggest lake, uh, land cannon could shoot about three miles. So it was the responsibility of the militia and whatever gunnery they could bring to bear on any ships trying to invade to be responsible for coastline defense. And anything beyond three miles was the Federal Navy had that responsibility. So even today, how we regulate wind power is based on how far those cannons could shoot. 
150 years ago. We are really weird when it comes to what history did to the state and what we're going through now and what the state looks like. We are very far north. How far north are we? We are farther north in northern Maine. We are farther north than most Canadians. When you actually look at where the Canadians are, where the bulk of them are, um, Fort Kent is north of Quebec City, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. It's north of all the major cities in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. If you are north in the Arusta County, you are north of most Canadians. That's how far north we are. If you go halfway up Maine, uh, that yellow line there in the middle, halfway up Maine, you are right at the northern tip of New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York, and you're only halfway up the state of Maine. We're that far north. Again, that goes back to a war that didn't happen. Um, back after all these other treaties settled some of the wars we had, there was still a question about who owned the northern tip of Maine. Uh, both It was claimed by both the U.S. and Britain. And there was about to be a war on it, but they managed to settle it before it came to blows. It was called the Aroostook War, a war that never actually happened, but they negotiated a settlement, settled pretty much in the St. John River as to where the border was going to go. And so we are, by agreement with the British, farther north than most of the rest of New England, all the rest of New England. As a result, getting back to birds, we have a lot of northern species that other states don't have or barely have. So spruce grouse. We have a lot of those, so much so that when Vermont couldn't really find a population anymore, they come over here and bar borrowed some of ours to bring them back to try to reestablish spruce grouse colonies in Vermont. We have blackback woodpeckers, supposedly a rare bird in Maine, but really I don't find them to be all that rare. It ju I just go up where people don't go, and uh, they're not reported often because people aren't there to report them. But we have these in the northern part of the state. This is an American three-toed woodpecker. This one is hard to find. I can find them in about three places I know of, but these are very difficult to find. They're the northernmost woodpecker in North America, but they dip down into Maine and they're up there. Boreal chickadee. Uh, this is a northern Maine bird. Canada jay. This one is a northern Maine bird as well. They're in northern New Hampshire, northern Vermont, uh, probably northern New York, and, and other border states along Canada. The, uh, Canada. But it's a northern bird, and we have a lot more than anybody else because we are so far north. Parks. We have big ones, <laughs> and other states don't. There are 63 national parks, but there's only one park in the entire northeast. You have to go below the Mason-Dixon line all the way down to Shenandoah National Park, 800 miles away, to find the nearest other national park of those 63. We're all alone up here with the national park up here, and the next national park is that far away. Katahdin Woods and Waters. We're the only state, uh, only place in New England that has a national monument, at least on land. There is one on the ocean off the southern coast of Massachusetts, but land-based, we have the only national monument in all of the Northeast. We have Baxter State Park, which is bigger than the other two combined. Seriously, if you look, um, Baxter State Park over there on the left side of your screen, 202,000 acres. Um, Katahdin Woods and Waters, 87,000. Acadia, only 49,000. Um, Baxter State Park is way bigger than the other two federal properties combined. We have that much big park in this state. So all this is making Maine a bird sink. So when birds migrate north, especially from uh, the tropics, and they're heading for the north woods to breed, they're going to Canada or they're going to Maine. We're that forested, we're that far north. Okay, this is where we're coming. And we're a bird sink for winter birds and, and uh, ocean birds as well. And we're the bird uh, reservoir for these northern species that do find nesting colonies along the coast of Maine that don't exist anywhere else in the United States of America, not even New Hampshire. We have loons, a lot of them. <laughs> Other states do too, but they don't really get much further south than Massachusetts. And with all those lakes and all that water, we have just a ton of loons and waterfowl. Lastly, so you can start prepping your questions, we are dark. 
we are in fact exceptionally dark. If you look at the map over there on the left side, you can actually see without knowing where the border is, where Maine ends and Canada begins, because once you leave those unfragmented forests that are historically preserved in Northern Maine, you get into an area that is settled in Quebec at the same latitude, same woodland structure and all that, but that area got settled, it got turned into agriculture, um, it's more lighted, you get into that big black hole of Maine, and what you see on the right-hand side is what's called a Bortled scale. It's a measurement of how dark your sky is. And if you look at the northern part of Maine, it's right down there between one and two. Uh, usually it's considered to be a one. We are really dark. There are places by the um, that are designated as dark sky preserves in the North Maine woods. Uh, and the Appalachian Mountain Club, there are some of their camps up there, treasure that. They actually do everything they can to keep that as dark as possible. So even astronomers like to come up and take advantage of what we have in Maine because we are undeveloped, we are wild, and we are dark in those areas. Even Acadia National Park does its best to stay dark. And when you go to Scudic Point um, in the winter or even in the summer, it's a dark enough sky. You can see things there in a Milky Way as bright as possible. Uh, that you just don't see anywhere else. We are so dark in places that the only place darker on Earth, the lowest thing on the Bortle scale, is Antarctica. In places of the Maine, we are that dark. Maine is weird. And that's the end of the story. So at this point, uh, I can't see chat questions, but I'll invite uh, folks to present them. Thank you, Bob. Certainly. Thank you. All so right. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat box. Bob, I really um, am amazed by all the different angles of research that you took, or maybe you just knew. <laughs> but um, all, I was just surprised at all the diff different things that were popping up. Um, as far as like perspective from the wind, to the wind turbines to, <laughs> yeah, everything you covered so much ground. And that's really incredible to think about all the, how all of those factors contribute to mm. birds. Yeah, it has made us a bird sink. Um, and as I say, there's so much pressure to keep the main North woods the way they are that there are large organized groups. And I, I started to list them all and said, now this won't fit on one slide. But there are just so many attempts to keep the Maine a working forest uh, in the North Woods so that we can continue to harvest the lumber as we always have, but not develop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on, um, on Friday, tomorrow at IHT as a part of the Wings Waves Woods Festival, we have someone named Jonah Levy coming from, <laughs> you know, Jonah? Yes. Okay, yeah, from the 30-year bird project to to speak on this and some of the research that they've done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. he, and I am... I, he and I did a lot of researching in the same area. <laughs> so okay, awesome. I'm quite familiar with where he was and where I was. Cool. Um, we have people in the chat box saying, that was awesome, awesome <laughs> talk, but no questions have come in yet unless... Oh, there's one. How many acres of virgin forest is left? I don't have a really good answer. Most of whatever virgin forest is left is in areas that they just couldn't get into to log. Um, obviously, a long time ago, it would have been a little more difficult at certain elevations in certain areas that were far from rivers that you could move. Uh, so you could move the, the uh, wood to mills. Uh, and you couldn't get a train in there to haul it out or Lombard log haulers, whatever they used to use. There are a few sections uh, where you just couldn't get into, and those are still virgin. But for the most part, there isn't a lot of virgin forest at all in the state. It's all been logged over, even Baxter State Park. It was all logged over at one time, uh, and it was pretty logged over when Baxter put it together um, back in the 1930s. Uh, so there's not a but but it doesn't matter because the forest does grow back and so you get into baxter now and it really is a very mature forest uh anything really over 80 years old 
is back to the state it probably was at one time. Um, Bob, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed hearing the the different ways that make Maine unique, um, as Noel <laughs> mentioned as well. Um, and I just wanted to kind of add to that the history piece. Um, you, you you mentioned Native people, um, the, the the land being stolen from them in the beginning, and um, I just wanted to kind of add to that history piece that this this is still um, Native people's original homeland. Um, and in in discussions of colonialism, I think it's important to acknowledge that. They it, those um, experiences were very detrimental to their culture and to their tribes, mm. um, with the the genocide and the removal from land, and um, they're still feeling those impacts today. So just as we have this discussion <laughs> about history and land and um, kind of everyone being here and how we got here, I just want to acknowledge that thousand mm. year old um, history and 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 the impacts from that here today. So we mm -hmm. can all learn more as well. Yeah, I agree. I'm very much in sympathy with that view. <laughs> yeah, Lander, to add on to that and maybe to like pull this into a little bit of a question and we do have more questions coming in, which is great. Um, one of my friends who is Penobscot shared with me that there are writings of the sky literally changing color when the flock of geese, or geese <laughs> called, or ducks called the flock. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I know that there's like different names for different right. groupings <laughs> of birds, but that there were so many ducks mm. that it would change the color of the sky, almost like a big cloud was coming over and that we don't see that here anymore. So I'm curious, Bob, in, in your research and expertise, if you've um, learned anything about the effects, the more negative effects of colonist practices on bird populations? Yes. Um, habitat loss is like the chief reason the birds decline. And obviously, as we develop more, uh, there's more decline. I think the biggest change we probably made was draining a lot of wetlands over time. You know, as we did more development, as we built more cities, especially along the coast, a lot of wetlands got filled in. Um, and then, of course, you cleared an awful large part of the country for agriculture. At one time, Maine was much more agricultural. Uh, if you take uh, the area where I live, just above Orono, Old Town, uh, out in Bradford and Hudson and stuff, a lot of that was farmland that is now regenerated back to forest. But we cleared a lot. And then, of course, when the lumber companies went up into the woods, and cleared, they just took everything. <laughs> At one time, we didn't have any idea of sustainability. It was all virgin and available to be profited from, and they went in and they cleared it right out. So yeah, that had just an enormous impact on the bird population. And even today, one of the things we still debate is when you do when you flood huge uh, tracts of the Canadian forest in order to make hydropower, you are wiping out a tremendous amount of bird habitat doing that. Uh, so you still see, and we see the declines today because of uh, how much wood is harvested up there to make junk mail. Uh, so we, we're still going through the same debates that we have for a long time, and we do see the impacts. Let's see. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> uh, one thing Amanda, I do you want to read, should, do you wanna read the I next one? Oh, yeah. Probably, one thing I should probably have mentioned when I was listing off, saying there were too many, uh, organizations trying to preserve Maine uh, and conserve Maine. One of the ones that pops right to the top is land trusts. <laughs> uh, Maine, I think it's one of the things that people should envy about Maine is the more development pressure there was, the more land trusts popped into existence. And there's even the Maine Land Trust Network, which networks all these together. We are organized in trying to not screw this up too badly. <laughs> and so land trusts play a huge part in this. And some of them are pretty big, what they do around the uh, down east, the lakes, uh, down east lakes there. Um, that's tens of thousands of acres being preserved by what's essentially a large land trust. Thank you, Bob. Mm. Um, let's see if I can get the question in the right order here. It looks like we have one. Can you give us some examples of how the bird populations have been affected by the warming of the Gulf of Maine? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and it's not just that. Um, the whales too. Um, and I, and this is really very short term. I would say within the last five years, you're seeing the impacts much faster. 
uh, and Bar Harbor Whale Watch, which I go out on several times a summer because the birds out there from the Southern Atlantic come in there. And so I go out to look at the birds and I don't care about the whales. But they used to have a tour which would go over to Petit Manan, one of the puffin colonies, see the puffins, then go out and see the whales. Well, those whales are less predictable than they were just five years ago. Used to be they go to places called the East Bumps and the West Bumps and the ballpark and over behind Mount Desert Rock. And they were pretty reliable in these upwellings because that's where the food was pretty good. They became less reliable. And sometimes the Bar Harbor Whale Watch would have to go out five hours on a cruise to get the Graham and Ann Channel over in Canadian waters in order to find their whales. So they could no longer do the puffin and whale chase. And all of that is because of the warming Gulf of Maine. Some of that is becoming much less predictable. This last summer, I saw fewer South Atlantic birds than usual, and they seem to have left earlier. Uh, I think there's probably some indication some of our whales are maybe going up to Canadian waters instead of the Gulf. So we are seeing those impacts, and it's very fast and pretty recent. Thank you, Bob. Um, that kind of answers the next question a bit, which is, is bird life changing over the past few years? So any other examples come to mind along that thought that you'd like to share? Yeah, I talked about uh, shorebirds and how they use the mudflats. Um, <laughs> now that I'm getting old, I can remember history. Uh, and like 30 years ago, if you were in the mudflats in Lubeck, you would see tens of thousands of shorebirds. Now, if you get a thousand, you're having a good day. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the warming that is also affecting the Arctic and how much food is available, how much land has been flooded by rising sea levels. Uh, so we are seeing massive declines in a lot of bird species uh, affected by climate change. I pointed out boreal owl, a boreal uh, chickadee as being one of those birds that uh, is changing, uh, that is a northern bird. I used to get those uh, in Stonington. Um, now I have a hard time getting them in Lubeck, if I can get them at all. They have almost completely disappeared off the coast in just seven years. Um, I can still find them up in the North Main Woods, but that bird has just vanished that quickly over a very large area, an area larger than Connecticut. We have another question here. When dark skies get brighter, do the species that don't hunt nocturnally suffer as well? I'm going to say probably not very much. Um, they're used to having to hunt in a full moon and a, and a new moon. <laughs> so they're a little bit adaptable. And in winter, some of these owls will come out and, and feed in daylight. And all the northern owls, uh, snowy owl, great gray owl, um, northern hawk owl, they're daytime hunters because in the summer, the sun doesn't set. So I don't think uh, owls and some of those night birds are really affected so much. Well, you might see some effect of some of those other birds and art owls, things like uh, uh, whippoorwills, nighthawks. They're being affected, I think, by a vast decrease in food because we don't have the insect like we used to. Next question, Bob. Any bird outings planned? <laughs> Yes, I'll be guiding for all three of the next festivals, starting um, with the uh, festival in uh, Wings Waves Woods. I, I think I'm doing a Saturday morning walk over at uh, Old Settlers Quarry, Old Settlement Quarry, uh, and that one's dedicated to learning birding by ear as a novice, but there's lots of other good walks. I lead another one, I think, on a Sunday morning. Um, and then, I'll, then I'm actually the guide out of the boat trip to go out to see the puffin Sunday afternoon. So that's the next thing I'm going to do. And then I'm doing some other activities for the festivals to follow that up in Lubeck and then over in Acadia National Park. So yeah, I've got way too many outings. I put a link to the Wings Waves Woods Festival in the chat box if anyone wants to check out the schedule to get details of when you can take a walk with Bob this weekend. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So it looks like our last question is, um, have clam populations changed in the mudflats? Bob, do you know that question? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, we, we have an issue, uh, common eider, which is you know, the largest, it's the largest duck in North America. Um, it almost went extinct. It was rescued the first time. Now we're seeing huge declines again. And it appears it's because the mussels have really vanished in a very short period of time. And that's their chief food. 
Um, the thought is it may be green crab, which is an invasive crab from Asia, uh, which has been here a long time, but it also has population swings and uh, they eat the mussels and they also eat the crab, the, the clams. So I think we are seeing a decrease in the mussel harvest and, and clam and shelled critters altogether because of predation from an invasive species. Uh, and certainly we're seeing the decline in eiders because of that. So yeah, it's been affected. Yeah, th thanks for linking it back to birds and to <laughs> the eiders. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. So yeah, we just, we have the, as you can probably see too, Bob, a lot of thanks in the mm -hmm. chat box. Somebody loves your column in the Bangor Daily News. <laughs> Um, I, I shared your YouTube channel link a little while back when someone was asking for some links. So mm -hmm. um, if anyone's interested, it's back up in the chat box around, let's see, 4.16 p.m. is where I put it in. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, if, if, you, if in, no one needs to remember it, it just might go into YouTube, enter Bob Duchesne, uh, and it's spelled in the newspaper every week so you can find it. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'll pop up and it's there. Awesome. Thank you again, Bob, so much for joining us tonight and mm -hmm. sharing um, all of your knowledge with us. And uh, I think we're going to be excited to go out and look for those like kind of interesting exotic birds that are out there that we might mm -hmm. not have known about. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Bob. And so grateful to have your participation again in the Wings Waves Woods Festival. And thank you everyone for attending. And if you're nearby, we invite you to join us for Wings Waves Woods this weekend. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.